guys, uh, we have Megan Turner from USA. She's going to give a talk, very important talk, complications in transfer of work, etc. She has done a systematic review as well, so she's going to talk about this very, very important work, particularly for nurses or, or like intervention radiologists or maybe the patient or the clinicians who are involved in uh, managing the complications. Thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here. Um, it's a little overwhelming. Um, I'm a young pup, I would say, because, you know, somebody was giving a talk about the very first talk, 19, I think it was Jay, 1983 was when we first started thinking about this. That's the year I was born. Uh, so, and we learn so much in medicine every 10 years. It's an explosion. If you don't evolve, you're behind. Um, so, I'm talking about complications. Um, I'm at West Virginia University, which is in West Virginia, the state of West Virginia. Um, small state, very rural, very beautiful. Motto is wild and wonderful. Um, but it's also 10 years behind, like actually, you know, in terms of what we offer, viewpoints. Um, my disclosures, I do uh, do some teaching for uh, intuitive on the SP. Uh, it's very small on our area, and um, I am a proctor at our TORS course, which is sponsored by Intuitive uh, for the HNS. So we all know TORS has been around for 13 years. It was FDA approved in two, 2009. I joined residency in 2010, so right at the right time to be excited about all of this because the explosion of knowledge started to happen, and um, the debates about it were very um, widespread. I trained in New York. Um, so New York is a very Memorial Sloan Kettering, heavy radiation, uh, heavy bias toward radiation. <laughs> Patients want radiation. They don't want scars. They don't want big um, mutilating surgeries. And unfortunately in the U.S., um, our surgeons don't have a broad experience in transural laser to make the jump to TORS very um, easy. So I'd say in Europe, people have made the jump to tours easier because of that rich TLM experience. And that has not been so easy in the US. And I think we have what we call high volume centers and low volume centers in a way that matters that may not exist in Europe. So we're talking about tours for the oric pharynx. There's been an expansion of indications because it's awesome and I'm biased, like I said. Um, so let's talk about safety. So the safety of TORS after 13 years has been brought into question because of order two. Um, I should also point out that two of my partners, one of the radiation oncologists and one of the surgeons in my group are on this trial. Um, they didn't recruit any patients, it closed before we could, but um, I'm fighting this bias at my own institution. So um, there were deaths in the surgical arm. I think there you can call two of them questionably related to surgery. Um, yes, there was the bleeding death of hemorrhage that is the boogaboo that scares everyone and should scare everyone and we'll talk about it. And then there was vertebral osteomyelitis, which is, is an extremely rare complication, only in those patients with posterior or pharyngeal cancers. Um, I've had one, we'll talk about it. Um, but it occurred 110 days after surgery and 30 months into radiation. So I don't think we can clearly say that's a surgical complication. Um, and then there's an MI at eight months in, you know, that could happen in any trial uh, to anyone and be completely unrelated. Oh, uh, I'm gonna be very Trumpian right now and hold two hands. So, so training in New York, um, yeah, we didn't wanna do this to people. We had this data, it was exciting. These guys were doing this in Philadelphia. And I saw people trying to go through the learning curve. Um, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, they published this after their first 112 cases. And there was a death that caused a big stir in New York. And I didn't wanna have that happen to me. Um, and there was all this learning curve data coming out. I saw people trying to learn, they were doing the old peak and shriek set up for the tours and then cancel it because they didn't know what they were doing. They weren't comfortable with exposure. They didn't know if they could get it. Um, there are intraoperative complications because of that. 
you're awkward, you're hitting the teeth, you're causing dental injury. Um, and you don't, you don't want those, those are avoidable. Um, and then people are just even learning how to not have positive margins and get trimodality therapy. Because if you're trying to start a TORS program, we shouldn't be aiming for trimodality therapy. That's a failure. That's a failure in my mind. So is a positive margin. So I wanted to go to a place where I would be in the light. I was also a resident during Hurricane Sandy. That's New York and Hurricane Sandy. And I was just seven blocks below that dark line. It was terrible. Um, so I wanted to start being like enlightened. Uh, and so I chose to train at Pittsburgh because of this. Um, Jendon showed that takes 20 cases just to learn how to set it up. Weinstein repeated that and showed you could teach residents if you did it the right way in 20 cases. It takes you 20 minutes to get fast, to get good, to get efficient, to not have it take four hours. Um, the ECOG trial did a informative study to see how many cases it took you to reach an inflection point where you did not have positive margins. Um, that's this, this next graph showing that's where they peak is it about 20 or sorry, about 30 cases, and you stop having positive margins. Um, it informed the credentialing for that process uh, of, of ECOG 3311. But more interestingly, if you wanna not have complications, it's a much longer learning curve. Um, White et al. Uh, say this, it's, uh, I believe uh, she worked with Dr. Magnuson, and he, they showed that uh, it's 120 cases to really like ascend the learning curve. Uh, and this is broken into groups of 40. And you can see after, excuse me, I can do math, I promise, 30. After 30, your bleed rates, your, your intraoperative bleeding, all those regular complications drop. But then you have a bump again when you start in group three, taking on bigger cases, more interesting cases, more difficult cases, salvage cases. Um, that's the reason I was just saying to Professor Polari, I would say no to that case that I talked about because that is a difficult case and I am not through the learning curve and it's tough. How am I doing on time? Oh, terrible, oh, sorry. Um, so, uh, so, so yeah, so I chose to go to Pittsburgh. Um, the ECOG trial was uh, underway. Uh, we had a lot of cases, a lot of opportunity to learn. And um, so I think that in terms of safety, you really have to look at what data you're talking about. This is 67 patients. We talked about rare complications. Um, Dr. Polari wrote a great criticism in JAMA Oncology where he calls them black swan events. I mean, that's somewhat true of that trial. Um, this, is, this is a very large trial. Uh, I can't, I wanna say 500 patients. Can't remember the, the number, but one patient death. And I know we've beat this with a dead stick. Um, but part of that was institutional knowledge and just the institutional knowledge across the United States and the centers doing this. Everybody is comfortable with the procedure. They, while they may not be high volume surgeons, more than, you know, 20 cases in a year, they're still doing enough that they are knowing how to ligate. They have ascended the learning curve of, of generally their number of complications. Um, you know, I think Neil Gross can added one patient or two patients to the trial, but he is a high volume surgeon. So the people doing this trial were not having these, these little mistakes. These are, well, I wouldn't say little, they're like the early learning curve mistakes, which I have had and I will talk about. So if we look at this trial, I think the other interesting thing is that the hemoradiotherapy arm was not without its deaths. Nobody's talking about that, right? Why don't we talk about it? Well, they're not dramatic. A TOR's death is dramatic. Everybody in the hospital is talking about it. The patient's hemorrhaging out of their mouth. You may or may not get a trach in. It's traumatizing. The whole hospital has to recover from it. The chemo, chemo radiotherapy deaths are neutropenia and then they pass away like very quietly in the corner, right? So we don't talk about it, but it happens. So, I guess in terms of you know the the orator and the current debates and even a debate about you know complications, I think you have to agree agree on what data matters, right? Does that data matter? Is it equal to the to the data of much larger trials? And it's kind of waxing a little bit philosophical, but for a group to have an intelligent conversation, 
where you meet in the middle, everybody has to agree on what data matters and what's relevant. And um, it's sort of relevant in the world we live in, particularly in the world I live in. Um, it is Trump's world, you know, that's, those are my patients. Um, those are some of my co-surgeons, um, not in ENT, but generally. Um, and, you know, when you check the data, there is a massive amount of data about the safety of tours. Um, in the National Cancer Database, 4,000 patients, and uh, you look in the 30 day and 90 day mortality rate is 0.6 and 0.9. And it's corroborated. This is a, a, a data point that gets corroborated in other studies. So if, uh, oh, I apologize, there's so many. If you look at this study from, um, again, the National Cancer Database, um, TORS rates of death are 0.5% versus 1.5% and high versus low volume. Uh, here it is, this is better. Yeah, so high volume versus low volume centers. And one percentage point, that's a lot when you're talking about 4,000 patients, this is not nothing. Um, and high volume centers were defined as doing fewer than 10 cases a year. So if you're doing one a month with your vacations and other things that happen, right? Because we're human, um, you may fall into this risk because that's just not enough to be good at something. And we know that's true of everything, thyroid surgery, whatever. Um, and then looking, this is an earlier study, um, just looking at an outside database, the MOD database, um, which is on, it's an FDA uh, manufacturer's database to look for adverse events. Uh, they found a mortality rate of 0.3% and it was bleeding that was the complication uh, that killed people uh, at a rate of 3.1% of the complications. Uh, so I thought I would look at this uh, as well. This was spurred by being with uh, Bob Ferris and me wanting to inform myself on how to start my tours practice and um, win friends and influence people. Uh, and uh, it was also born out of some visits to some great places, a conference in Lausanne with Christian Simon and with uh, um, Professor Lawson um, in Belgium. And so we looked uh, at all this and this is works into how I think about, about patient selection and how to prevent complications. Um, if you're a trainee, I think there are some here, this is a great uh, you know, webinar you can jump on uh, to hear some people bounce off ideas of how they select patients. But it's, it's informed on, on things that we know already uh, from, from this systematic review. So there's technique that you can learn and do this learning curve thing in training. And then there's, how am I doing on time? I'm almost there, not many more minutes. Okay, there's technique, which that anatomy lecture was excellent to teach you. You need to find the vessels. So you have to go find them first, then think of your tumor. The, the margin cuts you made at the very beginning, but next is finding vessels. That's how you ligate. You ligate them inside, you ligate them outside. You have to understand these peculiarities of the tortuosities of the base of tongue and the dorsal lingual artery to prevent these things. Oh, really? Okay, Whew. all right. So then, then there's ligation of your vessels and it's, it's really getting the branches right where they come off and right before they enter the oropharynx um, and not being worried about a pharyngotomy uh, when you do this because you can fix that. It's, it's more important that you make sure you get the branches contributing to the bleeding. Um, I've been asked by my residents and it's been asked generally in the literature, what is the, what's the problem with that? Well, first of all, I think the free flap surgeons would have a problem with it you know, because then they don't have vessels when this recurs and they need to salvage. But my answer would be, you shouldn't be selecting a patient that you think is going to fail that then needs salvage surgery. How about we just cure them and hit that 95% uh, cure rate, right? Um, so don't worry about that. Worry about that later. Um, I'd rather have that than a dead patient. <laughs> um, first bite syndrome can happen. Um, it's I have found, and I think some others who I've talked to find it's more when you go after the main ECA trunk or up as high to get the ascending pharyngeal, you can treat it with Botox. It goes away usually, um, it definitely goes away with radiation if they get it. Um, but, oh, uh, double lid up, sorry about that. So what, what factors uh, actually put patients at risk for bleeding? That's what one of the goals of this uh, review were. And uh, one was, Perioperative anticoagulation. So you should choose a patient who can come off perioperative anticoagulation. If they have a fresh stent or new heart attack, you should not operate on that patient. You should send them, you know, it's unfortunate, but why kill them? Um, 
also with a stroke or a heart attack, right? Um, not just bleeding. Um, large tumor sizes, T3s, T4s. Um, so again, if you're on your learning curve, you're probably not going to choose a T3 or T4 to start. But if you do, know that you have a bigger surface area of granulation tissue that will later bleed. It just makes common sense. Uh, the learning curve. This did not bear out statistically, but you can see in studies, I don't think those are clinically insignificant numbers, 50%, 40%. There are also just few data points in, in that part. Um, and then uh, ligation of arteries. So it also depends on what you're defining as hemorrhage. So when I think you talk to patients about uh, complications of TORS, you need to say, listen, the hemorrhage rate is not insignificant. It is based on this study, um, 5%, 5.8%. Uh, 5 That's overall hemorrhage. That's the hemorrhage that is akin, including the hemorrhage akin to tonsillectomy bleed. What are the tonsillectomy, primary tonsillectomies and little kid rates of bleeding? It's about 6%. That makes intuitive sense that they should be the same. It's the same granulation tissue in the same place. And you're having the patient eat within two weeks, right? Um, but when you're talking about um, major bleeding, well, these things don't really affect that. It's really whether or not you ligated the patient and whether or not you had a vessel injury. Um, so these factors, they, they are significant for overall hemorrhage. But if you ligate a patient, and you think that that's gonna help with that, it's not. It, there's, they still will have bleeding from granulation tissue and veins. So it, it had no impact. The relative risk was the same um, on the overall, that's TAL, overall bleeding, but major hemorrhage, and that is defined as hemorrhage that takes you back to the operating room or gets embolized or gets a trach. Um, that has a 40%, sorry, a 60% relative risk reduction, or it's a 40% relative risk, right? Um, so that's significant. And uh, that's why you should ligate everybody. Now that also ended up not being totally statistically significant, but I would still say that's clinically statistically significant. And there have been follow-up papers that included three more patients uh, than this, three more bleeds than this. I believe it was a paper by Sharble, this is TLM and TORS. Well, I thought about combining that data, it included one more paper from LaCourie and he had like three TORS bleeds out of maybe 10 cases. Well, that pushed you over statistical significance, but I, I don't think that's fair. It was to me too heterogeneous to add. So without a doubt, ligate. Um, and then let's see if I can get this video to play. Oh, I need to not be on laser pointer maybe. What am I doing wrong? So I guess, hmm? Convert to? Uh, it won't let me. Well, so I, I basically put this up here to show you this massive tumor that I took out, uh, which I knew because I studied the uh, operative imaging, the preoperative imaging like very well. I knew that there was, a very large branch of the tumor coming off of the lingual artery. I went to go find that, I clipped it. I tricked this patient because I was leaving the country a week later. Uh, and, and I opened his neck, even though he didn't need a neck dissection, this was a minor salivary gland tumor and I ligated those vessels so that I didn't have bleeding. And this little video is him saying, I love lollipops at his visit the week right after I got back. So two weeks post-op, he's eating. He was eating when he left the hospital without an NG tube. Um, if you select your patients well, you can have incredible- I love outcomes. lollipops. Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry, that was totally an accident. I hit the wrong button. Um, so anyway, so I have had an uphill battle uh, doing this. And um, these are the number of tours for oropharynx cancer cases that I've done over five years of fighting this battle. And it's only done when you prove to them constantly. You're under tons of scrutiny. If you're gonna go and do this in a place where it's not accepted, it doesn't matter. Um, you're gonna to have to prove it to people. Um, your data also matters. Um, and your patient population, you know, I, I don't have an ideal patient population. They come late. Um, so you have to get the word out. They are smokers. They are the intermediate risk. I have patients, 
And uh, I really appreciated the comments earlier about, you know, being in Africa, South Africa, and patients not having access to radiation. I have patients like that. There's no way they'd be able to drive. They don't have the resources to drive every day. So I have to choose tours for some people are a little less than ideal, but I have really held myself back in a lot of situations because I don't want to have complications that, that, that also just kill the program entirely. Um, uh, one of the papers um, looking at bleeding complications from the National Cancer Database showed that the number of base of tongue tumors over time actually decreased year by year, probably because when people get out there, they get more bleeding with base of tongue, right? I mean, these are, you have to think about it this way. I've had to start out with 75% of mine being base of tongue. Why? Because the local ENTs are like, well, that tonsil cancer is easy. I'll just take that out with transoral surgery. They weren't sending those. They were only sending the patients with base of tongue. Um, so I've really had to be in adverse circumstances, but really teach myself how to, how to ligate vessels and, and, and prevent complications. But I'm pretty confident I'm going to have a job to come. So it might have taken me a while to start, but we have anti-vaxxers as well in, in West Virginia. They're all anti-vax. That's a billboard literally from my state um, and, and, and a nurse actually who endorsed it. Um, so there's misinformation out there and uh, I'm sure I'm going to have a job. Uh, so here's my, my bad complication. My third patient this is actually the uncle of the I love lollipops guy. I love lollipops came after this. So, you know, your patients appreciate you even if they had terrible complications. Um, but I was up front with him and I told him, what's your real bleeding risk? You know, can it happen? I'm gonna have a tracheoset in your room. I have literally a line about bleeding risk in my consent uh, process and it cites the numbers from, from my review. Um, so he knew it could happen and uh, he's forgiven me for it, even though I nearly killed him. So this, this was the cancer. Um, it seems very superficial. It was a bilateral case. I felt like I'd be able to get negative margins. When I got in there, what was I more concerned about? Positive margins than this other, um, this other lingual artery, right? I didn't get the actual lingual artery itself. I got the branch coming right off of the, the greater cornu. But I also got spooked because it was on the opposite side. So I couldn't ligate that side and I had to clip perfectly. And I put my clips on. And while I was doing my neck dissection, I looked in the mouth because I thought, oh my God, what if I've ligated both, right? His tongue was white. I'd put the clip on the main branch, really getting control. I had to go back and, and clip it, take the clips off, take them back on, make sure I had the clips in the right place. So then I got really spooked. I'm like, have I damaged this lingual artery? I didn't ligate this patient. I kept him longer as well because I didn't ligate him. Um, and he bled on post up day four and I got the CT scan because I went to the operating room and I couldn't find the bleeder. Didn't explain what I saw there. Didn't explain his massive hemorrhage. I had to trach him at the bedside. And so I got this scan after I got out of the operating room and then I looked at it and I said, no, that looks like active bleed or, or like an aneurysm or something. Maybe I can go see it. I took him back the same night to look for this. Still couldn't find it. Got him a um, CTA two days later, four, seven days later, he bled again because I kept him. I couldn't, something was wrong, right? This is what I had, a pseudo aneurysm from all my clips on and off bipolaring to try to get uh, bleeding control. Um, so you can see it's, it's big. I had to convince the IR people to go get this. This scan was not enough for them. They waited on it for a day. Like I was like, why, why are you going to let him bleed? Don't let him bleed. And then I had to call the next one who was on call. And the next one on call was like, yeah, you're right. I don't really want to be coming in when he nearly bleeds to death. I was like, this man nearly bled to death seven days ago. We we're going to do this to him again. Right. Um, but he did fine. He got embolized. He's two and a half years out. His only complaint, I'm sorry for this, his lost teeth due to radiation. Um, but I nearly killed him, right? Um, yeah. 
So, um, so this, you know, I, I could show a symbolization. There's the bleeder. Um, here's the other terrible complication. The one that canceled the trial. It's not this patient in the trial, but I've had it. It was a posterior pharyngeal wall uh, cancer. Three weeks later, she told me I'm having more neck pain. This is three weeks after surgery. So her neck dissection pain went away a week after. And then she came back for her swallow eval at three weeks. And she says, you know, my neck hurts more. And I called her back and I said, hey, can you come to the hospital? I left a message on their phone. She started acting, wha acting wacky. Her husband brought her to the ER, altered mental status. She ended up having this abscess, you can see. And she actually had meningitis. Um, and I, I went and talked to the orthopedic surgeon. I said, this is a complication of my surgery that just needs to be fixed. If she doesn't get it, you know, knowing the, out, the outcomes of this trial, you know, she could have a high C2, C3, for like collapse and paralysis, and then she'll be dead because she'll have to go on a vent. Um, they fixed it. She's alive. Unfortunately, she recurred just at like 1.9 uh, years. She was a, that was an HPV negative cancer and it was in a smoker. Um, she, she didn't do well. Would I choose a posterior pharyngeal wall in an HPV negative again? I'm not sure. You know, the, the results are bad. Their swallowing function is terrible, right? I learned the hard way um, on that one. Oh, it didn't help. So I think we have to be thoughtful about studying complications. I'll leave it at that. And, you know, these are my numbers, but I think when you're starting, you have to be like very, um, you have to intensely scrutinize yourself. And then having opposition also makes you have to be able to show data for the scrutiny you get. Um, and uh, you just keep going, uh, but safely. And, and it encourage people to be in trials. I don't sit there and say, hey, surgery is the way you wanna go. I say, you have an equal chance either way. You're choosing upfront complications or you're choosing um, later complications. They're different. You have to think about it yourself and you have to be the one that chooses. That confuses some of my patients, but at the end of the day, I need them to be happy, you know, and, and not get sued. Um, Cause that's a real thing for us. I was even sued as a resident in New York. so. Like when I said I wanted to learn, uh, I did, I was a little bit fearful of being sued when I started as a young attending because it already happened as a resident. I was named in a lawsuit or something, you know, that an attending did, right? So um, I'll, I'll take any questions. I think I had like a little bit more, but I, oh, not much more. Yeah. Thank you very much.